Court. Uh, I'm Attorney Patrick Kakis on behalf of David Orr. Uh, Mr. Orr was an inmate in the Lorraine County, I'm sorry, the Lorraine Correctional Institution on July 17th of 2014. Uh, that morning, Mr. Orr woke, wasn't feeling right, he was suffering some sort of mental distress and uh, was quite disoriented, didn't really know what was going on around him. Uh, What's in the record to show how that stress Start. Uh, there's not there's not a whole lot, just Mr. Orr's statements. Uh, Mr. Orr stated that he just wasn't feeling well, wasn't feeling himself. Um, at that point, the COs came to his cell. They were uh, requiring everybody to move to, uh, to breakfast. Uh, they ordered him out of his cell, and he remained silent. I, I believe the testimony showed that he just kept staring blankly, was just ignoring what was said. Uh, nobody really understood why. Uh, Mr. Orr was dragged out of the cell. There's a, uh, a long period of time where he's moved to a chair. They're trying to get him dressed. Uh, at some point, they they do attempt to move him, and they said that he goes to a, a dead weight state. And they drag him, and at that point, uh, allegedly, Mr. Orr kicks one of the COs. Uh, they do attempt to move him to the medical ward. Near the, uh, the entryway to the medical ward, there's another uh, small altercation. It's unclear whether there was a, a fight or if Mr. Orr was, again, it was just a struggle of moving a, a grown man through a doorway. Uh, at that point, uh, Mr. Orr allegedly elbows another CO. Uh, I don't believe either CO suffered substantial injuries, but again, there was the, the allegation that he kicked and elbowed two different people. Uh, Mr. Orr does not feel that there is uh, sufficient evidence and the manifest weight was not reached with the conviction for uh, both the obstructing official business and the assault on a police officer, uh, corrections officer in this case. Um, mostly because there's the, uh, the knowingly requirement for, a, for an assault case. Mr. Orr, again, stated that he was in a, uh, a state of disorientation. He wasn't aware of what was going on around him. He didn't knowingly cause harm to a CO, he didn't knowingly attack or, or become combative. Uh, it's, it's more that there was a struggle of moving a person who was in, in dead weight, uh, not some volitional act to uh, assault either one of the COs in this case. Uh, furthermore, his, because he was so disoriented and wasn't really aware of what was going on around him, he couldn't act in a way to knowingly obstruct any sort of official business, again, he didn't seem to know what was going on around him. There's no possibility that the knowingly requirement was met in this case. Uh, Mr. Orr also feels that there was a, uh, a trial tax imposed in this case. Uh, I believe this court, State versus Tucker, uh, handled this issue just recently. In that case, there was a, a nine-year plea offer uh, offered prior to trial. And after the trial, the court imposed a 25-year sentence. In this case, there was a, a, a substantial conversation on the record prior to the beginning of the jury trial, prior to the jury being brought out and being seated. Um, the state had offered Mr. Orr a six-month concurrent sentence. Judge Butleski stated that he would not be comfortable with a uh, concurrent sentence, and then offered a six-month consecutive sentence. And I believe uh, his actual quote was, that he would sentence him to six months consecutive if Mr. Orr changes his mind between now and then, then being the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming either the beginning or completion of trial. Uh, upon completion of the case, there was no real new information given that wasn't already discussed during pretrial conversations, and Judge Butleski 
sentenced Mr. Ward to a seven-month consecutive sentence. That additional month, while it's not the nine-year to 25-year difference in State versus Tucker, is still a difference created just based on the fact that Mr. Ward exercised his right to a trial by jury. Uh, counsel, it, it kind of, through the briefs, and of course we'll review the record, uh, but it kind of sounds like this discussion about I'm not comfortable with the consecutive time or the concurrent time, I'm sorry, with respect to the, it, it sounds like the whole discussion is about concurrent versus consecutive time and not a whole lot of discussion about six months versus seven, seven months. That is correct. Um, however, there was a specific number of six months still guaranteed if he were to plead that day before trial. Uh, and upon completion of trial, Judge Betleski did impose a, uh, a more uh, strong sentence. He, he did add an additional month on to that six months consecutive, making it seven months consecutive. And again, there's, there's no real reason for it. There was no new information that was gleaned at trial. It was, it was a very straightforward trial. There was no, I guess, really no, I, I guess it would be suspenseful moment where all of a sudden there's some new information that nobody was aware of. So you say there's no objective reason for it? Yes. Uh, it would appear that Judge Bitleski just imposed a trial tax. There was, he wasn't uh, acting as a fair and uh, impartial trier of fact at that point in time. And uh, upon sentencing Mr. Ward to an additional month of time, it, was, it, it appears, based on the trial record, that it was just due to the fact that Mr. Ward exercised his constitutional right to a trial by jury. If there's no questions from the panel, uh, I'll the remainder of my time for about Plenty of time left. Thank you. But you deserve one, so that's that's fine. That's where I'm sorry to wind up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning again. May it please the court, Elizabeth Lindbergh on behalf of Appellee, the State of Ohio. David Orr was indicted on two counts of assault, both against corrections officers, felonies of the fifth degree, and one count of obstructing official business, a felony of the fifth degree. Ultimately, he was convicted by a jury, and the trial court sentenced him to 14 months in prison, consecutive to an already existing case. The first assignment of error that Mr. Orr raises is that the verdicts for assault and obstruction uh, of official business were not supported by sufficient evidence and were against the manifest weight of the evidence. As this court is aware, for sufficiency purposes, uh, the review is done by viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution. Any rational trier effect could have found the essential elements of the proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, this would be the burden of production. For manifest weight purposes, uh, this court is to review the entire record, weigh the evidence and all reasonable inferences, consider the credibility of witnesses, and determine if the trier effect clearly lost its way and created such a manifest miscarriage of justice that the conviction must be reversed in a new trial order. Again, this should only be done in extraordinary circumstances. First, for the assault verdicts, um, Mr. Orr argues that the state was unable to prove that his actions were knowingly done, that he knowingly assaulted these corrections officers. Knowingly, according to the revised code at 2901.22b, states a person acts knowingly regardless of purpose when the person is aware that the person's conduct will probably cause a certain result or will probably be of a certain nature. Further, it says a person has knowledge of circumstances when the person is aware that such circumstances probably exist. A person's state of mind can be inferred um, from the totality of the surrounding circumstances. In this case, um, there are, based upon the transcript, there are several uh, facts that were elicited showing that Mr. Orr did, in fact, knowingly assault the police officers. Um, first, when he was sitting and down in his cell and they, the corrections officers were attempting to get shirts on him, he jumped up um, and they were able to get a hold of him and put him down to the ground. However, they were having a tough time getting him handcuffed uh, because he was not giving them his arms and he didn't want to be handcuffed. Also, uh, Sergeant Biltz said that Orr uh, came up off of the chair or out of the chair, started throwing fists and going into a physical rage. That's the transcript at 191. Is there a videotape of what's happening inside the cell? I believe there was a video of, you could see the cell block, but I don't know. I'm. I'm not positive that you can actually see what's going on inside the cell as much as the hall in front of the cell. So the officers that were not wearing body 
I, I do not believe so, no, there's no evidence to suggest that. Um, then once the officers were getting Mr. Orr through the Sally Port doors, Mr. Orr kicked Officer Zagola in the leg. Everyone was trying to then get control of his legs. Um, according to the testimony, the video showed that when the officers were escorting him out of the door, Orr turned and kicked Officer Zagola twice, at which time he was taken down to the ground again. Um, that when he got through the doorway, he was kicking and thrashing, and he kicked his foot forward into Officer Zagola's left inner thigh. Um, Officer Atkinson testified that Orr kicked up off the wall, kicking one of the responding officers, that when Captain, Captain Wright said that uh, when he arrived, uh, Mr. Orr was combative, he was pushing back, and he had his feet up. Then they were able to take Mr. Orr to the medical area. When they were escorting him out, he started fighting again. Uh, he spread his legs apart, making it difficult for the officers to get control of him. Officer Atkinson then had to get under Orr's arm, and when Orr raised up, he elbowed Atkinson in the mouth, uh, giving this, or Officer Atkinson a split lip that started bleeding. Um, Atkinson clarified that the movement of Orr's elbow hitting his lip was caused because Orr was resisting walking out of the medical department. Orr started, uh, once they got him down to the ground, they stood him back up, and then Orr started fighting again, spitting and trying to bite the officers when they got him back on the ground. Uh, these are all examples of his knowing, resistant, and combative behavior in assaulting the police officers, um, both fulfilling sufficiency of the evidence review as well as manifest weight of the evidence review. Uh, the other argument made by Mr. Orr is that the obstructing official business conviction is against the sufficiency of the evidence, based upon insufficient evidence, and it's against the manifest weight of the evidence because there was no affirmative act by Mr. Orr in that when the officers arrived, to the cell, he was in a stupor and wasn't responding to officers, and that would be insufficient to uh, sustain a conviction on obstructing official business because there wasn't an affirmative act done by Mr. Orr. However, as stated based upon the facts that I just went over, there were several affirmative acts by Mr. Orr in fighting all of these officers. Um, as far as the affirmative act is concerned, that she, Officer Derrico was um, delayed from getting inmates to chow by five to 10 minutes. Sergeant Biltz and Officer Donegan responded, uh, as well as another yard officer. It took four people to get Orr under control. Um, all these people were taken away from their other duties that they had. Officer Zagola responded to a man down alert on the radio system after they'd taken Mr. Orr to the ground. Uh, and Sergeant Biltz, when he was called to go to the unit, he came from his office and left his routine, and two other yard officers left their duties as well. Captain Wright also responded to Orr's housing unit when the man down alarm was called. Uh, needless to say, even if the court were to say that he didn't have any affirmative action when the officers were first responding to his cell and he, wasn't, he just wasn't responding, um, he did engage in affirmative acts thereafter. As stated by Officer Sam, seven officers were involved in responding to the incidents initiated and engaged in by Orr, and uh, both Officer Zagola and Captain Wright responded only when the man down alarm was activated. So after he had already started fighting the officers, at least two officers were taken away from their duties because of affirmative acts that he actually did engage in um, when he first jumped out of the chair and became combative and resistant with officers. The second assignment of error raised by Mr. Orr is that the trial court denied him due process by retaliating against him for exercising his rights uh, not to plead guilty and have his case tried before a jury. The basis of this, again, is State v. Tucker, um, heard by this court, uh, the citation is 2016 Ohio 1353. The pertinent law is if the court makes statements from which it can be inferred that the sentence was increased due to a defendant's decision to proceed to trial, that the sentence must be vacated unless the record contains unequivocal evidence that the decision to proceed to trial is not considered when sentencing the defendant. Again, there is a distinction between a trial court placing a plea offer on the record and the trial court pressuring a defendant to accept the plea offer. And those are both quotations from State v. Turner, also from this court. Um, based upon the transcript prior to trial, the court said, I know that the state had made an offer for resolution, I think the state's offer, if I'm correct, was an agreed six-month prison sentence to run consecutive to the sentence Mr. Orr is presently serving. 
then the state says, yes, that was the offer. The court says that if that would have been the agreement, that's what I would have imposed. The court then does say, and I will just tell you that, although we haven't had that question posed, it's doubtful that I will do that, talking about concurrent sentences. I will tell you that even though the statute only suggests certain cases or charges are consecutive, um, it's my expectation, and then goes on to say, I understand that there might be fights between individuals at the institution. Um, and then later he says, when I'm dealing with assaults on corrections officers while somebody is incarcerated, it generally would be my practice that if a jury finds somebody guilty of that charge, or if they plead guilty to that charge, I would run the sentence consecutive. So that's number one, why I can say without question, I was not uncomfortable with the state's offer. Because as mentioned before, the state's offer was consecutive six months. Uh, but had Mr. Rewalk come back to me and said, well, judge, my client might be willing to plead to a concurrent, I just can't make that promise or representation because I think that some cases can have an impact beyond just what happens in the courtroom. And if so, and if, so anyway, I think this is one of those kind of cases that could have an impact back at the institution. So be that as it may, I'm still willing to impose a six-month consecutive sentence if Mr. Orr changes his mind between now and then. If the state withdraws it, then I would probably look at something different in that regard. The court goes on to say, generally speaking, there's a presumption towards a minimum sentence on the first prison sentence. Again, for F5s, that would be, this is not what the court said, but for F5s, it would be six months in prison. Uh, again, the court says that presumption is not applicable to Mr. Orr because he's already had imposed a prison sentence in that regard. So I would suspect that at the very least, if he tries this case and loses, he would be looking at more than six months consecutive. But I don't know that that's necessarily surprising news to Mr. Orr. I wouldn't think it would be. Um, then, once it goes to trial, the, case, the, the court heard the summary of facts that I just reviewed and saw all of the testimony and saw all of the witnesses. And then at sentencing, said the reason that he came up with the time frame is, number one, the presumption towards the minimum sentence is no longer applicable. So that was part of the reason for the seven months. I'm running them consecutive to the prison sentences because, as I said, before we even tried this case, that's generally what I do, because offenses occurring in prison can create greater difficulty, not only at the instant that, instance that this occurred, but also subsequently. And so I think the court takes a more aggressive approach with regard to offenses that occur within the prison system. Um, and ultimately then at sentencing, the court said that he considered the factors, um, the sentencing factors under 29-29-12, um, and made his determination based upon the appropriate uh, factors that are included in the revised code. Ultimately, the court said, as far as the consecutive sentences are concerned, it's clear that the court was not uncomfortable with what the state had offered Mr. Orr, because that was a consecutive sentence because a consecutive sentence was what was offered to him. The court was ultimately saying, if I had been approached with a concurrent sentence, then I don't know that I could make a promise as far as a concurrent sentence is concerned. He makes it clear even prior to sentencing that one of his concerns is what happens in the prison system and offenses that occur therein, and that would be of a concern to him. Also, the issue of it being seven months versus six months, Again, the presumption of the six months in prison was no longer applicable, so that was just a statement of that doesn't that doesn't apply to your case because this isn't a first offense for you. Um, it wasn't the court saying, I'm, if you go if you take this to trial, you're definitely getting more than six months in prison. You're definitely going to get more time if you don't plead guilty today. That is not the case that we have here, and that this court is presented with. If there are no other questions. For the foregoing reasons, the state of Ohio requests that this court overrule the assignments of error and affirm Mr. Orr's convictions and sentence. Thank you. Thank you. Can you have your one minute? Wait, I need to bother you. You sure? Yes. Okay. Thank you. We'll take the case